Good evening, and welcome to Having a Drink with Mink, the strongest comic-based video entertainment legally obtainable in these United States. As always, I'm your host, Jason Mink, bringing you another 20-odd minutes of four-color mirth and mayhem. I hope you have a nice beverage on hand, as the show has already begun. Here is the artwork from the first Sabrina the Teenage Witch story. Sort of. I'm not sure if the original art was unavailable, but this set of pages was specifically created for Sabrina's Halloween Spooktacular number one back in 1993. How? Well, I don't know. Most likely a light table and someone with a very steady hand were involved. In spite of their reproduced nature, these pages are penciled, inked, and even lettered, being something truly unique. Created by writer George Gladier and artist Dan DiCarlo, Sabrina the Teenage Witch made her debut in Archie's Madhouse number 22. The story is lightweight fun, which is to be expected. It is an Archie comic, and besides, the comics code was still very much an authority at this point. Honestly, I'm surprised MLJ were allowed to get away with it at all, as representations of the supernatural and funny books were strenuously frowned upon. As you can see, Sabrina Spellman is just a normal teen with some abnormal abilities. It actually makes for an interesting metaphor about growing up and discovering one's own inner strength and potential. And while the story is presented in a humorous fashion, it's clear being a teenage witch comes with all kinds of problems, and George and Dan do a great job of establishing the premise. While Sabrina seems resolved to her witchy circumstances, there's also an underlying desire to just be normal and fit in, something that all teenagers can relate to. And they did, as Sabrina continued to appear in Madhouse until graduating to her own title in 1971. It's interesting to see the editorial corrections here. Certain words and phraseology that were current in 1962 have been changed for a more modern audience. Stuff like this is endlessly fascinating, as it provides insight into the day-to-day -day process of producing entertainment for general consumption. And there you have it, a compelling piece of Riverdale history, if there ever was one. Thanks to Ken for letting me share these pages. Next up, did you want some free Marvel comics in 1985? I know that I did. Unfortunately, at the time, I didn't have one of these spiffy Cadence Publishing surveys. The cover letter is especially interesting, adorned with a colorful image of old you-know-who. The language is casual, conversational, as if you're talking to Big Jim Shooter himself. Why are they doing this? Well, they want to know more about you, their audience. Also, they're swell guys. Hey, send me the comics first, and then we'll make that decision. Ah, but first we have to fill out the questionnaire. And while I'm guessing it's no longer valid, let's do it anyway, just for a goof. I'm male, for a start. Oh sure, it sounds great, but there are downsides. At the time I was 13, and the economy was a little sunnier in 83, so my allowance was five bucks a week. Would you believe that I spent every dime of that on comics? I had no supplemental income, so instead of answering no, I'll just start drawing on the form. I did a lot of that back then. How many comics did I look at in the space of four weeks? Ten a week? So, forty? Half of forty is twenty? I thought this was a survey and not a math test, Mr. Shooter. I spent about thirty to forty-five minutes on average with a comic because a sense of thrift led me to read everything. To answer question 8, I had just discovered the comic shop, but there were a few newsstands that I would hit to get books I missed. I was never lucky enough to get a comic with the survey in it, but if I had, it would have been Peter Parker the Spectacular Spider-Man. And since I could never draw Spider-Man, here's how 13-year-old Mink would have drawn Captain America. Yes, I am available for commissions. I didn't bother with TV Saturday mornings as I wasn't enamored with Smurfs or Care Bears, but I watched plenty Sunday morning if staying up late for Night Flight and other 1980s cable goodies counts. This form helpfully suggests that we put it in the mailbox, and I helpfully write No Star Comics across the bottom. If you remember, you remember. On to the main event, and that's this week's comics. We begin with Captain Marvel 36. 
and dig this, it's signed by writer Steve Englehart. At first glance, this appears to be just another book in the run, but it actually reprints the first issue. This is an even bigger thrill than the autograph, as I've had 2 through 10 sitting in my to-read pile for about 5 years now. And while the first run of the stories are considered to be uneven and awkward, I find their sense of wonk endearing. I mean, his name is Marvell. Pretty on the nose, but hey, no sense in letting a lapsed copyright go to waste. The story is bracketed with a few new pages so readers don't feel too ripped off. If you ever wanted an upskirt of Ua to the Watcher, then this is the book for you, you perv. I got into Daredevil for the second time in 2016. In the 1980s, I dug Frank Miller's darker take but was unaware of the character's swashbuckler origins. Oh sure, the melodrama is still there, but this Matt Murdock isn't weighed down by conflicted morality and angst. He's a man of his time, striving, failing, and finally prevailing, only to move on to greater challenges. The bold and expressive Gene Colon artwork really plays into this mood. You get big, full-page panels of action. Consider the composition. Grok the colors. I'll take this over murderous girlfriends and endless ninjas any day of the week. I'll level with you. I never knew what the hell was supposed to be going on in The Defenders. I'm not sure the guy writing it did either. There were talking ducks, homicidal elves, and this angry Bambi, which I clearly remember in spite of the four decades since I saw him. At the time, I found the title off-putting, the wrong side of quirky, for my more sardonic reading attitude. As an adult, I've come to appreciate its oddball nature. Few things are allowed to be true to themselves, and this book, at least for a time, seemed to enjoy that rarefied benefit. Having the Hulk front and center of every issue certainly didn't hurt either. Marvel's willingness to simply let Steve Gerber do his thing is admirable, and his readers were the richer for it. Still not sure what the deal is with that elf, though. Defenders 53 sees the return of the Red Guardian. The Lady One. Still has a fin on the head, only fills out the costume a little nicer. And how about this art? Dave Cockrum, Keith Giffen, Michael Golden, and Terry Austin? Talk about a dynamic team. And this was a B title. And once again, those full pagers. From a storytelling standpoint, maybe a bit of a cheat, but they sure are nice to look at. And this was a rich period for Valkyrie. She didn't have a crap load of background, just enough to keep the character interesting. Here she takes the New York subway, getting a little closer to the mortal she protects than perhaps she'd like. And how about Bronze Age Godfather of Glam, The Presence? If a T-Rex song suddenly gained godlike sentience, it would be this guy. The mid-1970s saw a boom of filler stories in the back of Marvel Monthly books. Here Doctor Strange's girlfriend Clea takes center stage in a six-pager with some striking artwork. Not sure if Sandy Plunkett did much for the majors, but he was clearly on his way. His work has a very Michael Golden quality, which suits the story's more mature feel and tone. Here's Doctor Strange number 13 and another issue autographed by Steve Englehart. Doc's book was the place for stoner metaphysics and night gallery style imagery. Marvel was really striving to match the tone of Strange's classic adventures, introducing far out concepts like the visual personification of eternity itself. Whoa, is this stuff tobacco or Pink Floyd? I was especially struck by this representation of Marvel's nocturnal dream nemesis Nightmare. He possesses a 70s era freakiness that's so immediate and distinctive. Gene Colon creates an unsettling and arresting environment to plunge the Sorcerer Supreme into, an impossible place he'll be lucky to escape from alive. And here's our Creep of the Week, a happy little chap that could be straight off a box of freaky cereal. Now why haven't they brought that back? The Occult Files of Dr. Spectre doesn't get the attention it deserves. While many gold key horror offerings are mild to the point of sonambulance, this title makes with the scares, man. Every month, the Doc and his lovely and enigmatic partner Lakota encounter a different and yet familiar supernatural menace. Here they match wits with no less than Count Dracula and his vampire legion. Is three vampires enough for a legion?
Don Glut's snappy and character-driven script is beautifully complemented by the graceful lines of Jesse Santos. The artist's sense of space, pacing, and composition make these books a real joy to read, and you can still find them in the dollar bins. I never had much time for the Partridge family, other than Susan Day, of course. What a cutie patootie. So why did I buy this David Cassidy comic? To share with you, of course. What do you mean you don't care about David Cassidy? He's driving towards danger as we speak. He didn't leave the lights on in his house. 20 bucks says it's the Manson family. The intruder bolts before David can catch them in the act, but Partridge perseveres, chasing them down. And what do you know? It's a groovy chick. She's only stealing to provide for her brother, Tiny Tim, here. However, outside, some roughnecks have arrived. They'd be happy to just break in and steal stuff, but if anyone wakes up, well, tough luck. And that's just what David gets when the gang busts in. The leader decides to mess up Cassidy's pretty face with his leather belt, an uncharacteristically horrific scenario for a Charlton comic. Before anyone can miss being on the cover of Tiger Beat, David subdues the lead biker and establishes himself as alpha of the pack. Nature's funny that way. Following on, and it's David's deepest problem. No, it's not the fact that he's been 18 for six years. It's this clown cutting in on his lunchtime shag. He's fixing to mess up Cassidy's pretty kisser. Guess he didn't read the last story, huh? Our David is more than a match for this Beck wannabe. Take your devil's haircut and go home, kid. Later, a scuba diving session goes awry with our hero battling no less than a deadly great white shark. Well, green, anyway. It's deadly is the point, but David not only drives it off, he rescues the girl as well. Man, you couldn't write this stuff. I've been getting into E-Man lately, and what better place to start than issue number one? Things begin with a bang as a being of pure energy encounters a malevolent giant brain traveling through outer space. Said brain unleashes a bomb to devastate Earth, but the sentient energy intercepts it. Arriving planetside, it meets exotic dancer Nova Kane and takes on human form to learn from and presumably eventually canoodle with her. Joe Statton's fluid and expressive art is a real treat. I know the company gets knocked a lot, but Charlton had some dang fine illustrators. Before Doc Strange had his own title, he skulked around books like Marvel Premiere. In the early 1970s, Lovecraftian elements had been introduced into the mythos to spice things up, although they feel more like August Derleth ghostwriting, if that means anything to you. The big strokes are HPL, but the gears that drive the mechanism are that of his less inspired protege. As a result, the whole thing feels very, well, comic booky. Not the worst thing in the world, but far from the rarefied climbs of the Lee Ditko era. Strange Mystery comes to us from Israel Waldman's Super Comics line of unlicensed reprints. On the inside cover, beautiful young actress Quinn O'Hara says, Don't let them call you skinny. Yeah, I don't think that'll be a problem, Quinn. Wait On is for men, women, boys, girls, and convalescents. Not sure they're going to look as nice in the swimsuit, but sure, go for it. Our first story is The Hand of Fate. Ooh, wonder if Torgo will be in it. I guess at least part of what makes these types of strips effective is the dodgy art. While the subject matter was obviously horrifying, as a child I found the lack of quality most upsetting, and not from a snobbish point of view. You see, part of being young is believing that adults have things under control, that there's rhyme and reason to the world, and consistency and quality were hallmarks of that. The clean composition and considered line weight of an Archie or Harvey comic were reassuring in their inoffensiveness, easily repeated and repurposed imagery suggesting nothing but itself. And then you have this. Dense, sooty inks over questionably rendered figures and objects. Faces that change from panel to panel. Backgrounds that are rendered in monochromatic colors. There's just a general air of seediness to the whole thing, as if he went into one of those quarter booths that showed dirty movies. And if you get ripped off, well, 
Who are you going to complain to? You're not supposed to be reading these kind of comics in the first place. And if you think I'm being overly critical, I assure you, I love these sort of comics, specifically for the reasons cited, and I wouldn't have them any other way. If you want classy horror, pick up an EC, but if you want something to read that gets you in trouble with the nuns, then this is it. Next, the patriotic Americans over at Avon Publishing bring us U.S. Tank Commandos. If you like your war comics unhinged, then you are in for a treat. But first, a little something from our friends at Novelty Mart. These plastic teeth walk. They talk. They're alive. Now there's a pre-code horror story worth telling. Killer tank sees besieged American forces deep behind enemy lines. A Korean tank suddenly appears and unleashes hell, wiping out the soldiers. In retaliation, the West sends its own squad after the Korean war machine. And judging from the scale, these are the same tanks sold in comic books at the time. Realistic pedalmatic action. Some quick thinking by the Allied forces uses the enemy's vehicle's mass against it, sending it tumbling down into the chasm below. Bigger they are, huh? Trap of Steel sees a guy get his face blown off by a tank. I mean, sure, there's more to the story than that, but wow! These war books make crime does not pay read like the cats and jammer kids. Oddly enough, I don't recall them getting the same scrutiny as the crime and horror comics. Go figure. Death Target is a grim little tale about Davy Lockhart, a dreamer who finds out the battlefield is no place for someone with their head in the clouds. His ineptitude on the practice range sees him getting chewed out by the Sarge, but this only cements his desire to take on the enemy. When things go sideways and his squad needs to pull out, Davy decides to cover them as they escape. Mission accomplished, except Davy's head now has a couple extra holes in it. As if that wasn't upsetting enough, here's another offering from Novelty Mart. This time it's a colorful bank in the shape of Planter's mascot, Mr. Peanut. Well, his head, anyway. He dispenses his kin through a hole in his chin, dry-roasted victims of fate, a nickel a fistful. Grim. Very grim. We wrap things up with a comic I didn't even know existed until I stumbled across it in the wild. It's Popo of the Popcorn Theater. Seems innocent enough, I suppose. At least until you read the text. Gee, Popo, is there anything you can't do? Bumpy and his pals are excited to see that the circus is coming to town. And while Honey likes the acrobats and animals, the boys like the clowns best. Did you know the clowns are just regular guys made up to look funny? At least that's what John Wayne Gacy says. As if summoned from some dark dimension, Popo manifests behind them. Instead of running for the nearest cop, they start talking to him. Now, I don't remember all the safety films shown in school, but surely one of them covered rogue clown encounters. Turns out, that's Popo on the poster. Only, he's retired from circus life these days, but inexplicably, he still wears the full getup. Also, it turns out, he has no fixed address. In summation, we have a drifter, dressed as a clown, talking to unsupervised children, who calls himself Popo. The 1950s, folks. The kids offer to put the questionable clown up in their shack, and while it doesn't have running water or electricity, it's far enough out of town so no one will hear their screams, so Popo accepts. And while one suitcase is filled with the random detritus associated with the mentally disordered, the other contains reels of film for his popcorn theater. Surely a Herschel Gordon Lewis-esque horror show. If that wasn't enough, we then get Popo's origin story. Born to a circus acrobat, Popo wants nothing more than to follow in his father's footsteps, but Dad says the high wire is too dangerous for a young boy. Presumably stricken by dissociative identity disorder, Papa begins to dress as a clown 24-7, something Dad doesn't seem to have a problem with. So no to acrobatics, yes to squeezing into a tiny car with 15 other dudes? Talk about your mixed messages. And what's in Papa's bag of tricks? Why, rope of course. Run kids, run as fast as your pudgy little legs will carry you. Before we go, a personal note. This channel is not monetized in any way. 
I've never seen a dime from these videos, in spite of some of the commercials in front of them. Why? Well, it's like this. Remember the neighborhood ice cream truck? Getting something cold and sweet at the end of a hot summer's day was just about the best thing ever. Thing is, I didn't have a lot of pocket change back then. Money was tight in the mid-70s. That didn't stop me from running up to the truck with my friends, gazing slack-jawed at the parade of bomb pops, push-ups, and frosties. After all my pals had made their selections, I was left standing there, pockets out and a sheepish grin on my face. But the ice cream man knew what was up. He gave me a single banana popsicle. Sure, it was the cheapest thing he had, but he made sure that I didn't go away empty-handed. And that's what this channel is all about. Our videos aren't hidden behind a paywall. There isn't special content you have to pay for. You can show up with empty pockets and you're still going to get a treat. That's just the way we do things. However, if you enjoy what we do here and you want to buy Mink a drink, well, now you can. Just follow the link in the description box below or head over to Buy Me a Coffee and search Old Guys Who Like Old Comics Network. It's quick, it's easy, and you get us one step closer to that studio space we hope to return to. Thanks for joining us. I am your host, Jason Mink, and one way or another, I'll see you again next week. Cheers.